Hi, I'm Laura Weirich. I'm an associate professor at Penn State University, but I still hold an adjunct appointment at the University of Adelaide where I spent the last almost eight years of my life. Um, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how humans interact with their environment, the environment that they can't see. I think when many people think about their interactions with the environment, they think about being out in parks or maybe taking walks or maybe even how many animals or plants they interacted with outside. But these interactions and our sort of associations with environment actually underpin our health. And this health and its interactions with environment are mediated by microbes, these tiny little living things that encompass every inch of the earth. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit today about these microbes, what they are and in um, what they are on the human body um, and what they're doing for us um, and how they might reflect very long-term relationships that we have with our local environments and how that relates to health today. So I told you that there were microorganisms that you interact with on the outside in your environments, but you also contain many microorganisms that live inside of your body or within your skin. And we refer to these microorganisms, the bacteria, fungi, viruses, even little parasites as microbiota. Now this is more than 50% of the total cells within your body. So you're actually more microbial than you are human. And we know today there's over a thousand species. There might even be as many as 10,000 species. And this probably equates to about 1.4 kilograms of your total body weight. That's analogous to your brain. So you have an entire organs worth of microorganisms living on and in your body right now. And it's not just these microorganisms themselves that are very important, but it's the functions and their ability to do different processes for us that's incredibly important. And we refer to this sort of information that they carry with them in their genomes as our microbiome. Now, when we sequenced the human genome several years ago, we thought that we'd have all the answers to many of the diseases that plague us today. And in fact, we didn't. And that's because we actually missed about 99% of the genetic material that's in the human body. If we're lucky, humans might actually only have about 30,000 genes. Whereas the microbes in the micro and the genes that are contained within the microbiota actually account for somewhere between two to five million genes. And so much of what you can do on a daily basis and how you respond to things is actually encoded in the microorganisms that live on and in your body. And so it would make sense that these microbes with all their fancy functions and things that they can do for you would underpin some of the basic daily human functions that, that we sort of consider. Things like food digestion and vitamin production, those are linked directly to microbes that live within your gut and sort of digest your food before you have a chance to. And as they're doing that digestion, they actually produce many essential vitamins for you. But they also digest anything else you put in your mouth. So things like pharmaceuticals or drugs are also digested by these microbes before they hit the rest of your system. These microbes also help train and develop your immune system. They educate your immune system and when to react and when not to. They actually fend off infectious diseases as well. So they're constantly at war with potential invading pathogens. They also do things like help detoxify your body from different environmental chemicals or other things you might come in contact with. So if you disrupt these functions and you alter their ability to, to work properly within the human body, then it makes sense that you would get disease. And there have been a whole host of different types of diseases that have been linked or associated to changes in these bacterial communities in your body. So many sort of malnutrition or obesity, um, met metabolism type diseases have been linked to changes in our microbiome in the gut. Um, there's also been sort of issues with diabetes and, and sort of how well you're, you're able to deal with, with sugars and, and different dietary inputs. There are things that are also not as obvious. So some things um, like periodontal disease in your mouth can have influences elsewhere too in your body. They can make you more predisposed to things like preterm birth and even uh, things like renal failure. So having a healthy microbiome is very important for maintaining systemic and overall health. But one of the fascinating things about our microbiome is that it's incredibly dependent on the type of environment that we have and that we interact with every single day. So whether or not that's the local environment in your gut, which might be mediated by what you had for lunch that day, or whether or not it's where you live and the air that you breathe, um, or the job you, you're going to every day and the sort of microbes you might be exposed to in that environment, the environment really helps shape the type of microorganisms that are present within our bodies. 
These sets of microbes are incredibly individual. You have your own set that's unique to you, but you also share a proportion that are passed down from your ancestors and that may have actually related to what your ancestors were doing and where they were going and the activities that they were doing in their daily lives. But we know today there's been many studies that have described these sort of environments and how they shape our microbes. And they include things like different exposures to chemicals and other humans, but also things like pets and different types of medical treatment can also shape the type of bacteria and microbes that you have within your body. We now know today though that people who live um, what we would call, consider a classic industrial type lifestyle who are typically of European heritage have a very different microbiota from individuals who are living traditional based lifestyles whether or not that's doing most of your food gathering from foraging or hunting and gathering, um, or whether or not that's just living on country and sort of um, doing many more of the traditional practices that we would um, associate with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders today, we can see that the traditional based lifestyle has a very different set of microbes shown here on the right than the types of microbes and the types of microbial communities that we see that are present in Europeans or people living sort of industrial based lifestyles. So it seems that industrialization might be the single biggest impact on our, on our microbiota and having healthy bodies that link well to these microbiota. And there's been many hypotheses that have come out as to why this might be the case. Many of them are linked to the destruction in industrialized settings of many of the microbes that we carry on um, and in our bodies every single day. So whether or not that's having um, crazy hygiene type activities, whether or not that's using antibiotics to eradicate many of the microbes that our ancestors would have carried with them, or whether or not that's working in environments that are very sterile. So things like concrete buildings or, or homes and not actually being out in diverse forests, um, whether or not all of these sort of come together to cause this effect um, is still being explored. But certainly we know that industrial based lifestyle has significant impacts on the types of microbes that we expect to see within the human body. And this sort of signal that we see um, coming in from industrialization, we think probably has very big impacts on disease. Many of these, what we would consider industrial based diseases are linked to changes in the microbiome. It's altering these functions that the microbiome has that are actually linked to these different diseases. And in fact, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, uh, we see that these diseases are incredibly um, increased above people of European descent. And in fact, some of the diseases from this study um, have actually increased. So we know diseases like diabetes and obesity, which are classic descriptions of microbiome associated diseases, are actually up to five times higher in Aboriginal, Australians, and Torres Strait Islanders than they are individuals of European descent. And so it's probably not completely unrelated that you would have an increase in microbiome associated diseases at a time when you've had very recent, very large environmental changes in Australia and in these um, communities around the continent. And it also should come as no surprise that initiatives like Closing the Gap Although they were able to address access to healthcare and improve some of the social um, aspects of healthcare, we're not able to improve these diseases. We hypothesized that it might actually be because they weren't improving the microbiome. They weren't improving the diversity of microbes that we have on and in the human body. So we've been doing quite a bit of research to investigate the oral microbiome, the bacteria that live in the mouths of Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders, both in adults and children and trying to understand whether or not the microbes that Aboriginal Australians contain may be different from those of European descent and whether or not these differences may be linked to changes in health. And here's a study that we did with the, um, with the Indigenous Center for Oral Health here at the University of Adelaide, um, which is ran by Lisa Jameson um, and individuals like Costas Capellas and Joanne Hedges and Matilda Hansley-Davis all worked together to ensure that the study could come to fruition. And what we did was look at the bacteria that live on the teeth in individuals who are healthy or suffering from renal disease. And we looked at both people from European descent as well as Aboriginal Australians, both in the central desert region as well as in um, Darwin, and really tried to investigate whether or not the microbial communities we see are different and whether or not they might be linked to different outcomes in health. And in fact, we do see that the Aboriginal Australian microbiota is different. And in fact, we see it's also different in different locations. So microorganisms in individuals from Alice Springs, for example, are different from Aboriginal Australian individuals living in, in Darwin. So there's probably even local based connections that are different um, based on your local uh, environmental associations 
in the sort of microbiome profiles we see of individuals in this study. And I should mention that everybody's living an industrialized lifestyle in this study. Nobody's living a complete traditional lifestyle. And so we, we begin to think that many of these microbes might actually be related to our history and to people's connection to country. And in fact, when you go in and look at the type of microorganisms that we see, we see that Aboriginal Australians actually house what we call novel or unique oral bacterial species present in their mouths. Now these species have not been recorded in other European populations to date. And some of them are very likely, uh, are, are very likely tied to very deep connections to country. So for example, we find uh, a species of bacteria that live in the mouth of Aboriginal Australians in Alice Springs that are called endomicrobium species. And up until this study, the only place these were found before was in the guts of termites. Now, termites use these species to help them get energy from very low energy sources, such as wood. And they're using that as sort of an adaptation or an advantage in, in areas where you might not have a lot of access to other types of nutrients. So termites are using this microorganism to get nutrients out of wood. And it looks like the same microbe has been transferred into Aboriginal Australians sometime deep in the past. Now, in the desert, um, if you're talking about traditional activities that would have occurred over the millennia that Aboriginal Australians have been on country, um, you would know that eating termites was an excellent source of protein and still is in some locations. And so we hypothesize that these bacteria have actually been transferred from termites into the Aboriginal Australian microbiome and likely served a very wonderful adaptative strategy. And it very much harkens back to a beautiful connection to country um, and speaks to the deep integration that people have with their sort of local environments and sharing of microbes um, across species uh, that's integrated through very, very wonderful sort of um, ancient dietary practices. We've also been looking at oral microorganisms um, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And we've been trying to understand whether or not different bacterial communities in these children might also be associated with different outcomes of disease. Um, and in fact, we do find unique sets of microorganisms in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And it's very likely, again, that these are very much tied to um, local environments and to the sort of activities that their parents have been doing for, um, for, for millennia, um, for as long as people have been present in Australia. Um, what's also very interesting though, is that we find that the presence of caries or, or disease or cavities um, is actually potentially linked to different sets of microorganisms in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children that it is in children of European descent. Um, and that's also quite interesting because what that's saying is that the basis or the etiology of disease in these children might actually be different. And so simply treating this disease in the same way that we think about it in European children might also be something um, that we need to revisit and that we need to think about differently. Just as we did in the adult study, it's very possible um, that sort of diseases in different populations of people around the world are tied to their very deep connections to their environment and deep connections to country that people once had. And if you haven't gone through the industrialization process, if you haven't been exposed um, to many of the sort of um, pollutants or dietary strategies or health or Medicare strategies in this sort of industrialized world, that you might still carry these microbes with you and that those may be related to disease in unique ways that we've not yet um, understood or appreciated. And I think if we're moving into an area now where we're talking about personalized medicine, we can begin to explore how we might utilize, harness, or even treat disease um, in unique ways based on these sets of microorganisms that are distinct across different human populations. Regardless though, I think there's one thing we can think about and that's how we might rewild our microbiomes. If you have been living an industrialized lifestyle and you have a decrease in the, the sort of um, bacteria that your ancestors would have had when you were tied to your environment, you can think about how you might get those back. And we don't exactly know how to do that for sure. Um, we've certainly hypothesized that it's possible and we're working on research to track that. Um, and we certainly know though that spending more time outside, spending time in very native deep forest environments actually results in many microorganisms from trees, from the soil, from the plants, being transferred directly to your skin and into your nose. And so it's very possible that by revisiting our environments and spending more time outside and, and really integrating um, with our natural environment that we might be able to help our health by shifting and changing our microbiome and improving its, its functions for us on a daily basis. So I very much look forward to all of your questions. And if you'd like, please feel free to shoot me a message on Twitter um, or shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks.